Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Amy Bryant of Wild Child Counseling in Atlanta, Georgia, and I also have an online international group on Facebook called Parenting Beyond Punishment. And I am talking today with three amazing people that I'm so excited to be chatting with. Um, Tasha Shore is the founder of Parenting Boys Peacefully, also the co-author of Listen, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Challenges, and she's also a trainer at Hands in Hand Parenting. She supports parents through an online community and a variety of courses, and she really likes to help parents break the isolation piece of parenting and help equip them to face the challenges, well, of parenting, right? Um, you can find uh, more about her work and her offerings at parentingboyspeacefully.com. I'm also here with Viba Aurora. She is a transformation coach and parent coach in Southern California. She's been supporting parents for over 15 years, and she helps parents look beneath the surface to find the root of their child's behaviors and to better, better understand their own triggers. You can learn more about Viba at V I B H A dash aurora.com. I hope those are the right uh, addresses. You got that. And then um, we also have Leslie Priscilla with us today. Leslie is the founder of Latinx Parenting, where she offers coaching workshops and support and advocacy for Latinx and, and Chicanx. Did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. Families. Her work is rooted in children's rights, social and racial justice, the individual and collective practice of nonviolence and reparenting, intergenerational and ancestral healing, cultural sustenance, and the active decolonization of oppressive practices in our families. You can learn more about her work and offerings at latinxparenting.org. Welcome everybody. I'm so happy to be with y'all today and just to talk with you and share ideas and learn from you. And I'm just really grateful that you're here today. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So we are gonna invite participants to ask questions in the chat, um, but I thought we might just talk about some of these um, things that parents are used to dealing with. Lot, you know, what do I do when my kid lies? What do I do when my kid hits or when they yell at us, I hate you, right? And some of these common things. And um, I know as a parent myself of a teenager that um, the gamut of things that make us feel worried or wonder what we should be doing is deep and wide. Um, and so I invite you really to just share what comes up for you, thoughts that you have that you think parents might find helpful. Um, and if you have some stories of your own, of course, those are also welcome. Um, so what if we dive in? Anybody have a favorite topic? Well, before, before I choose a topic, I guess I, I would just say that the fact that you are saying that these issues are common issues out loud is a huge gift to parents because so much of the challenge of parenting these kinds of behaviors is the shame that goes along with them because we feel like we're the only one, uh, we have to hide it, we feel like the behaviors that are challenging are a result of something horrible that we did or a mistake that we made um, or that there's something terribly wrong with our child. So just normalizing it and saying, you know, oh yeah, these common behaviors like lying and saying, I hate you, right? Some parents are going to listen to this and be like, oh, those are common behaviors. I can breathe. So I wanted to start out by simply appreciating you for normalizing these behaviors, which are in fact normal and happen in just about every family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's so true. I forget that like some people are like, oh, my kid is doing this and they're the only one. I know nobody in their class or anybody else on our street is wrestling with this. But the truth is we all do. Even those of us who are parent coaches and therapists, even our kids who we, we know all this, all this stuff. Of course, there's no way to know all this stuff. Yeah. Um, but our kids are doing these things too. Yeah. Um, and so what what do we do how do we respond um, i think this is something that i've 
I've been like just right now, right? I have it, my oldest is 10. Um, and around that age, I remember this from my own childhood, but you know, certainly development also shows that the social dynamics start changing. There's, um, you know, just complexity, I think added at every age, right? At every age, complexity is added and we start seeing these social behaviors happen very early on and they start looking differently as our children get older. And so right now, you know, we're encountering challenges in, in the social situations um, and, and it's like a new plateau, right? Whereas like where I was dealing with, um, stories right the storytelling lying whatever you whatever you name it um when she was younger it looks so much differently now so i also want to give parents the grace to not have it figured out like not know the answer because i feel like parenting is such a game of you reach a plateau and then everything you thought you knew sort of goes out the window um, and that same tool that you use, that same strategy may not be applicable in that same way again, right? And so it's something that certainly I'm still dealing with, um, with my children being as young as they are. I have another child who's four and another who is turning three very soon. So these are things that are going to continue to happen, right? And, and um, there are things that I could suggest to parents. I don't get very prescriptive ever because it's it's so unique to each family. But I do also, like Tasha said, want to normalize that these are learning, like this is learning for both children and their parents. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that the tools that you're using with one child, most, most of the time will not be applicable to the next kid, right? We think we have it all figured out. The universe has a funny way of giving us the exact opposite. So we get the full gamut of the experience with the next one. So. It's a learning process constantly. Yes. And even something that was maybe helpful one day is the opposite of helpful the next day or maybe even the right. next hour, right? right. Um, you know, in the context of parents who are trying to figure out, well, if I'm not hitting my child, I'm not spanking my child anymore, or I'm not going to send them to timeout and, and isolate them, um, or shame them or punish them. You know, if we think about that child who, who's coming in and telling a story, I guess it kind of depends on the age, how we respond to it. A three-year-old who says, you know, there's a pink elephant in the yard, um, we might respond to differently. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we talk about that. How would we respond differently to it? Like a three-year-old versus a 11-year-old that says, um, there's a, a pink elephant in the yard, or I didn't eat that chocolate candy, and of course it's all over their face. Or um, I don't know. Anyone wanna? I think I've done that. I think I've done that in my adult age, where I have chocolate all over my face, and my kids are like, "Why is there chocolate all over your face?" And I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's such a good question, though, Amy. Um, yeah, it's, you know, so much of this, like for me, goes back to how I'm processing that information, right? Like how, like what is actually occurring in my body when, mm -hmm. when I'm being presented with, with this child telling me something that I may not believe. And, you know, and I want to say that like, it is important for us to believe children, <laughs> like we, we should and need to believe children um but when there's something like that right where it's like so fantastical or you you know for sure it's not true like i think the the first step is like okay what's what am i how am i experiencing this like how is this being received by me and and i think that is going to ultimately dictate how you move forward because if i experience that and i feel betrayed disrespected um unvalued as a parent you know um not taken I don't know, just like if I have like a little power trip over it where I'm like, you're lying to me, right? Like that could be if I haven't done the inner work of like not taking that personally and knowing that this child is, there's a reason for this, there's a need underneath it, there's a feeling that's happening um, as there is in me as a parent, that is going to be, you know, the determining factor, I think, in, in how if we're able to move into like consciousness about it um, and move forward in a way that's more intentional. I know that uh, Tasha and Viva have so much more to add here. 
Yeah, no, I think just piggybacking off of that, I think so much of it is developmental and the language that we use around that. Um, you know, to your point, like with a three-year-old, we know at three years old, many, well, maybe parents don't know, but at three years old, developmentally, their moral compass is not one of like lying or not lying. They're in imaginative play. And we want to encourage that rather than discourage that. And I think a lot of times what I come across in my work is parents who are plopping that label on the kid at the age of three, you're actually taking away the opportunity for that child to increase their imagination, right? So at three, I would encourage it like, oh, really? There's a pink elephant? Tell me about it. Does it have polka dots? Like, I want to join in that play of imagination with them. Obviously, that's going to be different at 11, but I think then it's more of, as Leslie said, you know, understanding the need underneath that behavior. If your 11 year old is lying about a pink elephant in the front yard, that 11 year old is needing something from you, you know, whether it be attention or time or, you know, maybe they need an escape. Maybe they wish that they were three again, you know, and to be able to like start that conversation of like, wow, you know, that's pretty interesting that you'd say that there's a pink elephant in the yard, like simple questions, like what's up with that? You know, not like, why did you say that to me? But just curiosity of tell me about it. Like, what's up with that? You know? Yeah. And I think the other thing Leslie said that I think is so important is when parents take things personally and we get activated and charged, then like all bets are off, right? Then we're in our reactive phase rather than our response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what I would say about lying is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow from my mentor and co-author Patty Whitfler because I've never met anybody who thought better about lying. I would, I would love to learn more about it, but I just love how she talks about lying. And I can't, I can't sort of off the top of my head remember all the gory details, but essentially like, you know, like you've already said, there, there's a reason behind it. And she breaks it down into four different kinds of lies, right? Um, if I can remember ones like, you know, I, I'm, I'm not bad. And that's, and that's like the probably most common one, I think, right? It's essentially, right, if you come in and the kid, the kid come in and comes in and they have chocolate over their face, all over their face, right? And they're like, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't, you know, I didn't steal the chocolate. And obviously they did. Um, essentially what we're asking them to do is to incriminate themselves, right? And even in like in the United States, at least supposedly in courts of law, we're innocent until proven guilty, right? And, and we, there, are, there are rules in place and laws in place so that we are not forced to incriminate ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We can, you know, remain, so we, have, we have the choice. We can remain silent and not incriminate ourselves. But when we're, we're, when we're putting our kid on the spot, we're essentially saying, you have to admit guilt in front of me, somebody who has power over you and has been using my power over you. And you know that if you admit the guilt, something negative or challenging or hard or demeaning or shameful or whatever is gonna happen. So I think we have to realize that we're putting them in this catch 22. Um, something that we don't, we don't talk about a lot. Um, you know, another lie that I see kids talk about a lot is, um, you know, sneaking things because we don't give them what they want. And so this can happen like with little kids with, you know, sp uh, sticking with the, the, the sugar theme, right. Sneaking, sneaking dessert or sneaking candy or something like that. But this can happen in teen years, right, with, you know, sneaking in your girlfriend's house or sneaking out of your room in the middle of the night and taking the car or sneaking alcohol or drugs or whatever. Um, and I think we have to think about, like, what's our relationship like with our teen? And for those of us who have younger kids or those of you, I don't have younger kids anymore. Mine are 15, 17 and 19. So but but when we have younger kids, um, what can we do to warm that relationship and, and build that, that trust between us so that our kids know that they can come to us with anything and that they don't have to sneak behind our backs? I mean, I, I remember when one of my kids um, earlier in high school said to me one day, he said, Ima, I think I'm the only kid who doesn't lie to their parents. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't know that he never lied to me, but... Uh, he, I'm like, well, what do they lie to their parents about? And he just gave me this litany of things, right? All of these things. And 
I just said, you know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you don't feel like you need to lie to me about it. Now, does that mean that I'm proud of everything he ever did? Definitely not. Did he make choices that I disagree with and wish he hadn't made? Absolutely. But we had conversations about it, right? He didn't hide it from me. He didn't feel like he had to sneak behind my back. And I think that's when a lot of our kids get, get into trouble because they're sneaking because, yeah, they, they want something. Um, and I'm trying to remember the other ones. I think, I think like, um, oh, I think kids will lie. Like if they want to do something, like um, uh, they don't want to, like we want them to do something and they don't want to do it, right? So did you take the trash out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I took the trash out. I took the trash out again. You know, they don't want to be incriminated for something they didn't do and they really don't feel like doing it. They'd rather be something else. So, so I think like, um, I think it was Leslie who said there's, there's always something behind it. Like what, what's the reason? I can't remember what the other one is, but 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 there's always a reason behind the lying, and we want to we want to think about it just like with all behaviors. What's what's driving it? Mm -hmm. The behaviors are just the symptom, but what's really going on, and how can we connect in a way so that we get more information instead of distance mm -hmm. ourselves from our child? Right, show up in a way where they feel like they have to curl in on themselves more, hide away more. Mm -hmm. We, we want to encourage the opposite, which is often the opposite of what we feel like doing in that moment, right? <laughs> which is like, rah! Right, right. That's why that piece that Leslie talked about is so important. I have to pause and see how am I receiving this, right? Right. And then once we can sort of uh, reframe it for ourselves and attend to ourselves and like do the little thing, you know, what's going on for them developmentally? What does this mean? And then how can we focus on that relational piece? How can we make it safe for them to yeah. tell us their truth? The other thing that came up for me when Tasha was speaking, you know, about, again, looking at the need, I think a lot of times um, our kids are, they want to please us. They don't want to disappoint us. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes lying comes up almost as like in order to protect us, from those feelings, right? And I think there's such an opportunity there where there is that kind of enmeshment to really um, use that as a teachable moment to be able to, you know, you're okay to do things differently than I do things, right? We don't always have to agree, um, you know, your job is not, you're not here on this planet to please me. Mm -hmm. It's nice, but you, you don't have to do it all the time. You know what I mean? Like to take that pressure off of them so that's not an added burden that we put on them of our expectations or, you know, what's going to embarrass us or disappoint us. And it may very well embarrass us or disappoint us. And that's ours to kind of navigate, mm -hmm. not theirs, you know? Yeah. It's scary, right? I mean, a lot of times there's a lot of fear that we're dealing with for ourselves as parents. What if they do sneak out? What if they do take the car? What if, you know, they do sneak into their boyfriend or their girlfriend's room? And these are still part of the lessons we're learning to go. How do I trust? Yeah. How do I build a safe relationship? How do I remember that this is a shared responsibility, not everything on my shoulders? Yeah, it's funny. They are not us. Yeah. They're not yeah. us. They're going to be different. They're going to have different values. And that feels kind of scary sometimes. Yeah. I, I don't know if y'all have seen Turning Red. Yes, loved it. <laughs> I have not loved seen it. it. Um, it's it's fantastic. I recommend so it to good. everybody watching if you have not. Um, but there's a dynamic to it where she feels like she has to start hiding um, parts of herself, and mm -hmm. it's rooted in the dynamic that that exists there. Um, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but there's something deeper that like it goes deeper and and further back um, in the ancestry, right? Yeah. So. Um, we have not had blueprints of safety um, in the way that we're trying to create that safety. And so we're kind of grasping at straws a lot of times. And, you know, we, we can read the books, we can, we can read the articles, we can do this. But, you know, even as you're all talking about certain things that you know, we, we don't want our children to do. It's like, well, I did, I did all of those things, right? I, I, I did all of that. And I was very good at hiding it because there wasn't that safety. And so I feel like what Amy has named in terms of that safety is so 
important and 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 starts from the time that they're very young and i think that there's going to be parents listening that are parents of children of all ages and i I also want to encourage to say that it's not too late right if your children are adolescents if they are um, becoming older you can still start bridging that trust in transparency right and in 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 communicating i haven't always made it safe for you um, to talk to me i haven't always um been in alignment with the ways that I really wanted to do things differently than my parents. So I wanted to give that hope a little bit and to just say, you know, for me, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's what I did when I was 15, 16 years old, you know? And so that fear that Viva's was talking about does come in for me where I'm like, what if that pattern is repeated? I know that I wasn't in a good space during that time to be taking all those risks, right? Um, and so that can also fuel us into being really good and disciplined in this practice of being of being trusting um, and and offering that grace. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that that brings up, Leslie, is when you were talking. Like I remember, for me personally, growing up, like you, like I did all the things, and I was very good at it for the most part mm-hmm. until I got caught. Um, but one of the things that I remember that my dad used to say, and I just, you know, in, as an adult now, as a parent, now I look back and kind of question it was, um, he used to say like, as long as you don't lie, I'll never be, I'll never be mad at you if you tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think being very clear with our kids, like I may be upset. I'm entitled to be upset when you tell me something that I don't like, but it doesn't change how I feel about you right? Like we're, we're allowed as parents to get upset. We don't have to have this toxic positivity. Everything you do is okay all the time, right? Like it's okay to be human and to show that full gamut of emotions that, you know, we are, while we're not enmeshed, what you do does affect me. And it does have a response and an emotional response from me oftentimes, right? And and then we're responsible for those feelings. I don't know how I'm going to feel, but you don't have to fix my feelings. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't have to fix your feelings, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. but we can all have them. We can all have the feelings. Um, I think the difference between us as adults with fully developed brains and our kids is that we can actually schedule time to feel our feelings or to, Mm -hmm. to have our upsets in a way that our kids can't, they don't have the the you know the the neurological development they also don't have the resources that we have as adults so i i do think that there is a piece of um yeah absolutely we're human and we don't have to like everything they do and i don't think it does is you know is a favor to anybody to sort of pretend like they're perfect and all of those things um, and I think, I think, I think it is our responsibility to notice what the patterns are that upset us, right? Which could be different. Yeah. Like for one parent, it's that when their kid swears at them, that just, you know, turns them bright red. And for another, it's like, whatever, you know, <laughs> and, and for somebody else it's spitting and for somebody else it's lying. And, and, and I think we get to notice patterns in ourselves and take those somewhere else so that yeah we're going to get upset we're going to mess up but for the most part we do need to do our best to show up calmly whenever we can even in the face of scary things right like what what i remember one of my kids was was pretty young and and uh, we were sitting in the living room and he said you know i was at so-and-so's house and um there was porn right and and I, I felt myself, you know, there's this little kid and I felt myself and I don't even think he said porn. I didn't know what he said, you know, but, but I was like, I could, I remember like my stomach dropping mm-hmm. and like having to just sort of pause and, and think, okay, like I didn't even know what to say. And so I just started asking questions. Well, you know, what did you see and whatever, but what are the things that trigger us so that we can not explode like oh my god i can't believe you're never going over there again like i can't believe their parents weren't watching like we could go to those places but we need to do our work so that we can be as calm as possible even though it's not going to be perfect Um, what when those scary topics arise because they do arise right And, and there might be a time when you're triggered and you go what and then you go wait i'm supposed to stay calm and then you go, sorry, 
I was surprised, right? You just kind of own that initial reaction and, you know, and sometimes you can't. And sometimes you can't. Right? I mean, I've said countless times to my boys, like when they were younger, I've like said, I I have to go in the other room. I said, if I stay here, I'm going to say things that I'm going to feel horrible about afterwards. I don't have anything nice to say. I have to go in the other room. Yeah. And, you know, they're sort of wanting to sort of to, to fight or have the confrontation. And I'm like, I'm going to get us into big trouble. I have to get out of here. I need to remove myself, but that's okay. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. Part of I, love that. I love that, Tasha. And it speaks to just like the timing, right? Like we don't have to address everything in that moment sometimes. Like right. we can we can feel the reaction. And even if there's a question from our child, like, you know, what, what do you think about that? Like, it's perfectly okay to say, like, I don't know. I need some processing time. Like yeah. we are, we're loading here. <laughs> like right. I'm not sure yet, right? Like I'm buffering. Um, and so taking that time also models that I think for them to be able to process whatever experiences they're encountering or any activations that they're encountering, um, which is valuable, I think, in the long term. But, you know, having the vulnerability to say, I don't really know what to say here. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard this from you before. So I'm gonna, I'll I'll figure it out. I I do know that we'll be okay. You know, like, I do know that we're going to get through this. I do know that we're in this together. And we're gonna like, this is something I find myself saying constantly, like, we'll figure this out, you know, we'll figure this out together. And I think if you have those scripts or those, you know, those things that you go that are your go to things that you can say, then if they're come like we, if we are as prepared as can be and we can think about okay what if my child brings me porn and we know what those triggers are but if there's something outside of that scope because there's always going to be i think things that surprise us and that we're not as prepared for um then we can have a script that we can go to right i'm not sure like i, I will we'll be okay i need to process like i'm not feeling well enough to communicate right now <laughs> like i'm feeling flooded or whatever like so much of it to me at least is has been about the vocabulary like what is the vocabulary that that I want to share and then I'm hoping that they then adopt that vocabulary um when the same you know when similar um uh encounters happen for them it's such an opportunity to model that everything has landed here in my chest Mm -hmm. and I just need a little time and I love that that language that you're using, Leslie, is about we're still in this together and, you know, I just need a little time and we're going to figure this out. We're going to be okay. Those are all amazing places to start. Yeah. Um, and then they also help the, the child's brain calm because they break the isolation, right? You're not setting them apart. It's not you'll figure it out or go figure it out. <laughs> like, we're gonna get through this. We'll figure this out. We're, like, we're a team. Yeah. It's, co, it's co-regulation and co-construction you know, construction of whatever the future is gonna look like. Yeah, I'm not gonna abandon you when things are hard. That's right. I'm gonna be here and it's gonna be hard for us both sometimes. <laughs> I think that's the true, that's like the true definition of cooperation, right? A lot of us think cooperation equals compliance or adherence to adult supremacy really is what it is. Um, But it's, it's the cooperation. It's the collaboration. It's like, this is a work and this is an operation and we, yeah, we are in this together. I think that's one of the most important things that our children can, can receive, can allow to like sink into their bodies is that they're not alone, right? They have this unconditional love holding them and it's not just woo-woo language like it it really is something that is felt um, by them which which for us I I celebrate so much because so many of us did not have that like we did not feel that unconditionality everything was conditional everything was you know either you were a good girl or a bad girl and you know and and then consequences would be dealt with accordingly (laughs) so um so I think for us like we are breaking these cycles where we're creating those those containers for our children um and and really redefining that cooperation Mm -hmm. and i really think all these things we're talking about this cooperation and collaboration co-regulation with them is applicable to everything from lying to how we respond to i've been watching porn to there's a pink elephant in the backyard to siblings hitting each other or children hitting us or children hitting friends. Um, 
and children shouting, I hate you, right? It's all the same principles showing up in all the myriad of ways that are normal parts that families are living together with, living together with. (laughs) (laughs) That works, yeah. Yeah. I wanna, um, just this just came to mind, but a few years ago, I saw some kind of like meme on social media, probably Facebook, that was a mother that had baked a cake for her young teen and the cake said so and so's first time saying I hate you and she reframed it into a celebration Mm -hmm. of the child having the safety to say I hate you and like Mm -hmm. part of the development (laughs) it's like okay here we like oh I didn't know it was going to be today so let's just acknowledge that that happened and not um demonize it not you know villainize (laughs) like this is part of development right Uh, a lot of times when children say i hate you it's a function of like the independence and the autonomy that they want to have right and and it's not again like we go back to not taking it personally um but it's maybe not something that you would celebrate or bake a cake for but at least acknowledging that that may be a part of that that development in the child and then also the development in your relationship right because that gives you an opportunity to repair which will deepen that relationship and there's so many things to celebrate about that that like you said this is an opportunity for us to get so curious and to celebrate that developing an autonomy and then what is that pushback you know what do we need what does the relationship need or you know am i holding too tight and i need to relinquish a little bit, um, it can feel complicated. And, and I think that's an important thing to, to normalize too, that many of us, um, like y'all have said, we were the ones sneaking out of the house and um, taking our cars out and all those things. And um, many of us are figuring this out as we go and figuring out how to return to love and how to listen um, and how to unpack things that have been handed to us generation after generation. Mm. I don't know, I kind of like the baking a cake. (laughs) Maybe I just want cake though. (laughs) I'm wondering, did Leslie say an early, a teenager? It was like, is that what you said (laughs) about the cake? Because I. Oh no, it was it was years ago, so I don't remember exactly oh. the age of the child, but I want to say it was like early teens, okay. like you know, 12, 13, okay. early adolescence. I was just thinking, wow, they made it a long time without me. I know. I was like, if you, you can <laughs> if you can make it to 12, 13, I'm shocked. Without hearing I hate you from your child, like you need to be running this. <laughs> this That's <laughs> really why she baked the cake, because she made it to 12 or 13. She made it, yeah. 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 <laughs> Totally. <laughs> I think yeah. it's also with the I hate you language or, you know, it's, it's that extreme language where, and I used to hate it when like therapists or teachers would say this to me, but it's like, oh, it's because they feel so comfortable with you. I'm like, great. Could you feel a little less comfortable with me? Because it's not just you that they hate. Chances are they hate their school. They hate their friends. They hate their clothes. They hate their room. And it's you're a target that's able to receive that and they know it's a safe place. They can't necessarily go and say that to their teacher because there would be consequences, but at home and with mom or with dad, with that parent that's created that bond and that relationship and that connection, it's the safety of, I can say the most horrible thing and mom can handle it. You know, it's, I think that's another huge part of it too, is again, getting curious about, okay, what are you, what are you hating about me right now? rather than like how could you you know it's again reaction versus response like i want to know more tell me more and oftentimes especially with teenagers they're like yeah yeah but i feel that piece of getting in the same boat and and being on the same team i hear you i see you we'll figure this out yeah you know and that's what they're seeking i'm having a hard effing time mom Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. yeah I think we've also done a really good job of, I was just talking to my nephew about this this morning. We were just sitting and talking about this, how 
um, you know, because I my work is really with parent, parents of boys and, and so many of their emotions are shut down from such an early age. And I think we've done an amazing job, which I'm not proud of, um, of, of categor categorizing emotions as either good or bad, right? And masculine and feminine. And we're like we've categorized these in all uh, in all these bizarre ways. And the reality is, all of these emotions are completely normal and all of us experience all of them and we need to be clear to our kids in whatever ways that we can that it's not unusual or or wrong or bad to be feeling what you're feeling right there are feelings and there are actions and as they grow we can help them untangle like you don't have to act on every feeling but the but the feelings are are normal and so we can can we share a story where we hated somebody i mean i felt like i've hated people before i felt like i've hated my kids before people who i love more than anybody in the world right but the feeling was real like i really did hate him in that moment <laughs> you cannot convince me otherwise so uh, can we share that with our kid maybe not in that moment, but at another time, it's like, you know, I, I, I have been so mad at people that I have really hated them. People who I know I don't really hate, but in that moment I did. Mm -hmm. it, it normalizes it for them and it makes them not feel like something is, is terribly wrong when they do feel those feelings. Because I think it's scary for them to feel those feelings. And sometimes that, that contributes to their acting on them, right? They're acting out around having them. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. It is such an, interesting one too to have such black and white thinking if I hate them in this moment I must cast them all out right stir the baby out with the bathwater. or yeah you know and how powerful to say like this is a visiting emotion this is a visiting feeling that's right and it's mm -hmm. intense and there's so much around it I haven't really thought about hate that way mm -hmm. and I love how Tasha the the frame of like it doesn't happen to, it's not only happening to you, like I have also felt this, you know, and really normalizing that for them, that it's not a bad thing. You know, it's not a taboo thing to say hate. Um, I like that. I like that being able to like open up the language for expressing it, how you need to express it in this moment. Yeah. yeah. It can be really scary to feel feelings that you know are labeled as bad, right? You know, people right. see them as bad and you're feeling them. Right. what do you do with them you try to hide them and then you can't of course because they have to come out somehow and then they come out in these yucky behaviors i think anger especially is such a villainized uh emotion for for everybody for adults as well right you can't um express your anger i think some you know marginalized communities especially i think deal with this like you can't express that rage. Uh, Lama Rod Owens has a beautiful book called Love and Rage, where he really names it. And Dr. Jennifer Mullen um, of Decolonizing Therapy also speaks on sacred rage, right? And how that rage is something that you can honor and that's trying to communicate something for you. Yeah. Um, and that oftentimes we we have this binary of anger and rage exists you know, separately than love. And you either love or you fear, or you love or you hate, or you love or you are angry or whatever. Um, but there's there's a value that sometimes is rooted in love, right? That that's rooted in love of yourself, of your autonomy, of your people, of who you know, whatever it is that you're doing. And that rage can be really fueling and and really righteous. Um, and so even more of a reason not to demonize that anger, right? Because you want to be able to know when to harness it. Um, and when it is appropriate and, and, you know, there's been times where I'll go online really, really late at night and I'll see, you know, memes of La Chancla or whatever, like the, you know, the violence against children. And I'm like really heated at like midnight and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was not a good time <laughs> to open those up. You know, it was not a good, but I'm still going to harness that and I'm still going to use it when it's appropriate. And so if we can guide children into using their anger, okay here is your anger staring at me in your in my face you know um cool later let's talk about you know when to utilize that um when it's appropriate not so much at me but that's also them practicing how to feel their anger right how to how to move through that right yeah 
what a big lesson for us to be learning with our kids, right? Uh, you don't hate them. Oh, wait, maybe we do. And then what, right? And then we have to learn it with them. I mean, <laughs> I do, right? Yeah, and such an opportunity to like learn from the feelings and the difference between feelings and acting on them, right? So we can feel that and we can notice that we feel that. We can share that with our parent or whoever, our confidant, right? Mm -hmm. but, but we don't have to maybe share it with that person <laughs> or <laughs> right? we want to leave space for the opportunity for the feeling, like you said, to move through, right? Because if we say something now, it, we might wake up tomorrow morning feeling quite different. <laughs> and often do. Yeah. Yeah. They say don't go to bed early or don't go to bed when you're upset. And sometimes really just you're upset because you're tired. <laughs> you need <laughs> no. to go to bed. Yeah. You need to go, go to, to bed. bed. I, mean, I see that in my 10 year old too. I mean, when it's like nine o'clock and she's like, you know, everything is bothering her. And I'm just like, oh, baby girl, like you're so tired. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, just, just come here. Let me like rub your hair. Like, let yeah. me, you know, massage your back a little bit. And eventually she soothes and then goes and calms down. But that is going to support her in recognizing that those times where she's feeling those emotions, like those feelings may not be communicating the truth to you in that moment. Like they may be right. a function of your basic needs not being met. I get hangry. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that's that doesn't mean that, you know, my husband is a POS or whatever, but that, you know what I mean? Like that that's me. Like that's my responsibility to identify what's happening when those emotions are are surging and coming to the surface and, and to deal with them. And luckily he doesn't take my my SHIT. So <laughs> he just turns it right back. Yeah, and we, we use it in work too, right? We, we say, well, I don't know, all of us, I, I definitely, if I get an email that, you know, enrages me or upsets me or insults me or is an attack on me or whatever, I, I wait 24 hours. It's like, I'm not going to sit there with all my feelings and write back to this person when I'm feeling like stepped on or insulted or angry or whatever. I'm going to feel the feelings. Like I admit I feel them, but I don't need to tell them that. And I don't need to respond. I can just sit with it for a while until I'm feeling even again and then decide. And I think it's a real opportunity to share those things, those experiences with our kids so that basically they're seeing, right? If you did the Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson talk about the upstairs brain, downstairs brain, it's basically like saying to them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring myself. I'm noticing downstairs brain, don't do anything. Like, hang on, break, wait, <laughs> right? Okay, I'm in my upstairs brain and starting to be able to recognize when you're in those different places and what's appropriate to do, what's appropriate, to you know, when it's appropriate to act and when it's not. Those personal stories are really so powerful, right? When we say like, my chest is tight and I'm knowing that I wanna land blast this person in this email, so I'm gonna go for a walk or, hey, will you play a game with me? You know, and like saying that out loud to our kids is really how they learn instead of us going, well, you don't really hate them. You just need to give it some time or whatever we might say to kind of blow up. Their emotions. It also helps them realize that it's not about them because so often we as parents show up and we get angry at our kids that, you know, for things that are, are ridiculous because we're actually angry at the email, right? Like I get an email and I'm upset about it. And then my kid comes home from school and I'm like, you know, why, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, I just get Why upset about what it yeah. is. Because, what? Why are you interrupting me or whatever? Exactly. Or, or, you know, why are you eating that for a snack? You should have eaten this. It's like, why do I care what he asked for a snack? I mean, I'm just mad at this person who sent me the email. <laughs> We're projecting. We're just constantly projecting. Constantly. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I'm I, The ability to give them tools for the expression of that, like, whether it's journaling or some physical activity or, you know, whatever, these are like lifelong skills that I'm hoping that our children will have. And so those are the opportunities, I think, where we can really demonstrate that. I've written, you know, I've written those emails back, but not sent them. <laughs> and I'm just like, listen. <laughs> or comment. Don't put the address. Yeah. In. <laughs> 
but email when you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can yeah. 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 Write it yeah, in the yeah. notes app. Normally I'll like write it in the notes app and say, how dare you, you know, so that I'm like outside of the email altogether because I cannot be trusted with technology. So, yeah. um, but we do want them to have that outlet just as we need to have that outlet. And I think that that's another muscle that we're building is like, oh, I don't actually have to react here. I don't have to respond. I don't have to, I don't have to acknowledge at all sometimes, right? Like, I feel like this is, something that happens a lot on social media where you just have like talking, you know, just people just yapping at each other and there's like really no purpose. There's no goal. It's just people wanting to feel heard and they don't, they don't necessarily need a response from you, you know, like they're just wanting that container. And, and if you engage, you're probably not going to meet their highest, most evolved self mm -hmm. um, in that moment. You're going to meet somebody that's defensive and vice versa and so it's so much of it is just you know timing taking the time mm -hmm. i don't even have to acknowledge that i can just i can i can block i can block this person this is great <laughs> it's, it's, you know in that way social media has been a really steep learning curve for our own boundaries the ways we engage with people understanding a whole new variety of showing up with their needs um it's not unlike being a parent or as a parent, having my own feelings and needs. So. This has been a lovely discussion and I am so glad to be talking with y'all and hearing your stories and, um, and just feeling connected and like, oh yeah, we're all in this, you know. Um, anybody wanna share any parting thoughts for um, people who are watching? I would just say be gentle with yourself. Mm. You know, there are only really two ways to parent, and it's either the way you were parented or the way you choose to. Neither of them are easy. You know, as we said at the beginning, it's a constant learning curve, and just giving yourself that grace and that compassion. Um, and just really, I think, becoming a part of a community so you don't feel isolated, because it's not just you that's, that's struggling or that's dealing with these challenges. We all are in different ways. And oftentimes it's the same challenge, right? So there's something to be said for community, leaning into that and asking for help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Baba. Yeah, I would just echo the, the finding your people, you know, just find your people because when you can't find it in you to be compassionate with yourself, then at least you can ask someone to like, throw down a rope, you know, and, and, and let you hear those things. Um, that is so, so key. And I think that because we live in such an individualistic culture, we don't often value the necessity of collectivism as much. And so, yeah, just community and, and patience, right? Like, I feel like I, I have gotten again to plateaus where I'm like, oh, cool. I like broke that cycle. I broke that pattern. I did it better. It's great. And then here comes another curveball, And then the frustration isn't even so much with my children, but it's with myself. Cause it's like, I thought I had gotten over that hurdle. I thought I had gotten over, you know, I thought I had healed that part of myself. And yeah, there's so much more that has not come to the surface yet. And so just know that this, just as children develop, I think Mercedes is really, uh, Mercedes Samudio is really, you know, the one that's been talking about parent development, right? Just like, this is part of your development too. And so that, that patience, um, is so crucial and the impatience, I think for me at least, is what causes the suffering sometimes. Thank you. I would say to remember or encourage you to remember that I believe the truth is that both you and your child are doing your best always. And if you can walk around believing that, choose to adopt that as truth, um, things will go much better. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you all so much. Um, so if you are looking to build community or you're needing support, all three of these people, I think even have communities um, of support. They definitely have workshops. They definitely offer parent support and coaching. Um, so please check them out. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and sharing your wisdom with me and with other listeners. Um, and thank you, everybody who is watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs>